be in, in the Word of God this morning, of course, in Joshua 5, 12, and talking about signs and wonders. And uh, this morning, I've, the, I believe this message is, uh, as I look across the church, I see, uh, you know, most of you have been around the church for a while, and most of you... Um, saved that I know and, and you love the Lord and so this message isn't really a, a 101 message but I pray it's a message that um, provokes you and I pray it's a message that there's some different things inside of it that I believe are really just for a few people and then there's the general message which is for everyone and as the Lord speaks to you uh, I pray that you receive that with gladness of heart and let that seed really grow up. And we're talking about the manna this morning. Um, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, the his children of Israel, as they wandered through the wilderness, they, they got up each morning and they had manna. And of course, on the, the Sabbath, they didn't have to go out and collect it because God just told them to collect enough for basically two days. And so they didn't have to collect it. But every day they got up. There was fresh manna, and, and I don't have manna in the bowl. It's just bread, but <laughs> it's just a symbol every morning. And they, they learned how to make different meals with this manna. God provided manna in the wilderness. He continued to provide. He ongoingly provided. And, and as they crossed through the wilderness and went around in circles, in essence, and finally whenever basically enough of them had died off, that they were able to enter into the promised land, they went into the promised land. And here they are in Joshua 5, 12, and the Bible says, And the manna ceased the day after they ate the produce of the land. I want you to hear that. It was the day after they ate the produce of the land. They got up, and there was no more manna. It stopped coming down. Just like that, everything stopped. There was no longer manna for the people of Israel, but instead of eating the manna that they had eaten, had grown accustomed to having for 40 years, and now they're eating of the fruit of the land of Cana that year. Father, we ask you, Lord, that this word would not be my word, but Lord, as you have inspired, I pray that it is received as your word this morning. I pray the hearts are touched, lives are changed, we're encouraged and, and challenged as always. And I pray that your spirit is in this room, Lord, to bring life and life abundantly. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. I mean, we see in, in this text here that one day everything changed. The manna is no, more, no longer coming down. It, everything changed one day. They, they've crossed over spiritually, physically. Breakfast is no longer the same as it was. I don't know about you, but I can get into a rut and eat the same breakfast every day. Sometimes some people eat cereal. Sometimes people eat toast, a bagel, and eggs. Whatever it is, they were eating the same thing every day for years. And this manna, though, literally represented a miracle from God. It was no longer coming down. The miracle from God was no longer coming down. For when they crossed over, there came some changes. There was an adjustment, a shifting. The day after they ate the produce, there was no longer any miracle manna coming down available. And how many know change can be hard sometimes? We, we talked about this a few weeks back, and I'm not going to rehash that. And some people, change is a scary word. And I'll be honest, I, there's some changes I don't like. But I think we're actually okay with it if we don't have to change. As long as it doesn't affect us too much. And I got a chart that I want to put up here. And I saw this and it indicates change. Now, this is where we start off at the, in the middle here, impact. The bottom is negative, how we feel about change. And the top is positive, how we feel about change. Most of the time when we see change and experience change in our life, the first step is we go through this process of shock and denial. I, I don't like this change in my life. I, I don't want it. I, I, and it, as you notice on the chart, we go through a really negative thing in our mind because change, it just, it causes denial. We don't want it. And it causes negativity to rise up on the inside of us. And that, that second step we go through when change is taken is anger and fear. 
our nation has went through a major change. The churches have went through change. Our jobs have changed. Our lifestyle has changed. There's been so much change. But even in the children of Israel, there was a lot of change that was taking place. They were crossing over. Moses was no longer with them. There was a new time, a new era. And how many know churches go through change? People go through change. My God, our lives. I grew up in my parents' home. I don't live with my parents. I got married. I have children. My children moved out. We all go through change. And, and these changes cause us frustration sometimes. They cause us anger. They cause us fear. And then the third state where it finally starts turning back from that negativity is we go through exploration or acceptance. And we say, you know what? Life is what life is. I have to make the best of it. I have to get up every morning. I have to keep pressing on. I can't stay down in here in this negativity and drown in the sorrows and the frustrations of change. How many know we can get to this place and some people can stay there? There has to be time for people to go through this process of change. And, you know, we may change and go to another building and people will always say, oh, it was better back on South Walnut Street. Oh, the church was better in those days. We can go through change, but life is full of change and God brings change. And even the children of Israel went through change. And then they go through a fourth stage is when you finally make a commitment to the life you have and you rebuild and you say to yourself, you know what? I can accept the change, and I will go forward. Life will be better. I'm not going to stay down there. I have hope, and I have something in, in, encouraging for tomorrow. And I'm talking to you spiritually this morning, all right? Don't get all caught up in everything else that's going on in the world. I want you to hear what the Lord is saying. There are changes in the church. There are changes in the spirit realm. There are changes in life. There were changes in the Old Testament. There are changes in the New Testament. We're going to shift. Yesterday, you know, I grew up up in the 80s and the 90s and church is different than it was back then. It doesn't mean it's just all bad. Jesus is still the same. The word says he never changes, does he? But our experience changed with it. And when our experience changed, we got aggravated. We got frustrated and things are changing. I, I want you to stay with me because I know you're thinking deep right now, but stay with me. We all have to be willing to change. God never changes. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in the, you know, in, in the moment of twinkling of an eye, we will all be changed. <laughs> There's a lot of changes, isn't there? And, and I'm not focusing on the change this morning, but I'm focusing on the change, the shifting of bread, of bre the manna to the produce of the land. In our text, the children of Israel, and this change has taken place. There's no more manna. And first off, we think to ourselves. After we have crossed over, after we have reached the destination that God really wanted us to reach, why would the manna stop? Why wouldn't the manna increase? If you get to the place where God wants you, why doesn't the manna increase? And in our text today, we actually see what happened. God provided another flow. But I really like the manna. But God provided another flow. I want, you to, I want you to hear that in your spirit this morning. Because some of you are going through a real change right now. Maybe it's on the job. Maybe it's in your life. God is able to provide another flow. Amen? Amen. All right. All right. All right. We're going to keep on rolling. That maybe that was just for one person. But God, you can't get hung up on the manna of yesterday when God wants to flow in some new things today. So let's get back to the manna. This is a miracle of God, wouldn't you say? That's what the Bible said. It's a miracle. You know, it was provision. It was an everyday miracle. Manna is coming down was a miracle. It was a sign, and it was a wonder. The miracle only went on while they were in the wilderness, though. Keep it in mind. The, the type and the shadow of provision only goes on while they're in the wilderness. The sign that God is, is with them and he's, and he's raining it down from heaven, this only took place while they were wandering. That was not the ideal place for them to be. That was a difficult, a struggling place, a, a time of trials and, and testing. And it's an amazing when it hits us that God never leaves us nor forsakes us, even in our most difficult time.
even in the biggest trial. And you think back and you remember, I know I remember in times of, of great struggle, uh, when I was lost, when I was not on my way to heaven, when I was blaspheming the name of God, when I was speaking negative against the church, when I wasn't right with God, I remember him showing up. And sometimes it's no different than when you look in the mirror and say, I need to do something with my life. I've got to change some things. God in his grace and mercy was speaking to you. That was the manna from heaven. It was somebody who came along and loved you even when you didn't deserve to be loved. It was somebody coming along. That was the provision, the mercies of God. How many know God's been good to you even when you didn't deserve it? There were times, right? I mean, I'm not, I can't be alone in this. He was there. I specifically can tell you there was times in my life when I wasn't right and God spoke to me. And I think about this. God was giving this mighty sign and wonder in the wilderness to the children of Israel. Every morning they got up. First thing on the morning, the first thing in the day, they saw a miracle. The first thing they saw, the first thing they ate that filled their belly was a miracle. God was giving a sign even then when they were not allowed to cross over. See, when they were stubborn and hard-headed, God was still providing manna, a sign. I, I will tell you, I was stubborn and hard-headed, and God still provided a sign for me, all right? Maybe you weren't. Maybe you were always seeking, and you were just off a little bit. But I was hard-headed. I was stubborn. And God still spoke to me, and he spoke to them as well. There's many today that will say, well, just, you know, let's get the church back together. If the church would perform, or if, the, if God would provide more signs and more wonders, more people would believe. I mean... In itself, it sounds, it sounds logical. If we could just see more people getting out of wheelchairs, if we saw more healings take place, if we saw more, more people who were blind open up their eyes, doesn't it make sense that more people would get saved? Wouldn't it be something if mirac miraculous power would take place, if real gold dust that we could collect and take to the coin shops and cash in was forming. Amen. Miracles of God were taking place. No other description. It seems to make sense that if those things took place, people would come by the numbers to Jesus. But look and see what happens. The more God did miracles in the wilderness at any other time, the less, the harder the people's heart got. The more signs they got, the harder their hearts got. So we cannot sit there and realistically say more miracles would mean more salvations because we have a book that gives us a great example of millions of people and all that they did. And I don't believe we're going to see any greater miracles than the plagues of Egypt that the Israelites saw. The lice, the frogs, the water turning to blood, the hailstorms, all those things taking place. But yet their hearts still got hard. They left and, and there was a, a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. But yet their hearts still, they saw these things. They saw the Red Sea part. I don't know what it looked like. I wasn't there. But they saw, they experienced that. If I saw that, that might change me forever, okay? If I'm ever seeing something like that, I, my first thought would be a tsunami. But they saw that, but it didn't necessarily cause them to believe anymore. Their hearts got hard. They every morning ate the manna. Every day they collected it, but it didn't seem to make a difference. Their hearts still got hard. What happened? The Bible says in Hebrews 3 and 9, for in Israel, many couldn't enter into the promised land because of their unbelief. I suggest you it's not signs and wonders that build our faith. It seems like it should be. I want to see him as well. But would it build our faith? Let's go a little bit more into God's word. Just like the Israelites, the performance of signs and wonders stir people to seek more signs, and they don't stir people to seek God. I got three scriptures here. First John 4 and 8, or 4 and 48. The Bible says, Then said Jesus unto them, Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Unless you see a sign and a wonder, you're just not going to believe it. There's no faith in Christ in this, but it's an appetite for performance. And how many know the church has gotten to a place where they know how to perform? 
they know how to perform. There's actors and actresses, and, and they've been continually put into a stage. They, we, the, the church bashed Hollywood for years, and the church became its own version of it. It's a performance-ridden culture is what it's become. And in the heart, a genuine lack of faith in God and a need for God to show his hand or for a person to perform some sign and wonder. And I don't want to make fun. And I, I, please don't. But there's such an emphasis on it. People want a coat waved at them. They want something, something done to them. And they say, oh, I, I feel so. And they go in great numbers to experience that. But they don't take the time to spend with God that they need to take. They seek a sign. The second one is Mark 13 and 22. It says, for false Christ and false prophets are going to rise. And they'll show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. Those who are following signs will be misled and deceived. The Bible talks about this. Because there is an appetite for power and a lack of knowledge that opens a door for deceit. When we get hungry... To do a trick and a gimmick. You see it in the book of Acts. You see where they want to buy these things. They want someone just to casually lay a hand to receive an, an ability, a calling, a, an, an authority that they don't necessarily have the, that God's never given them, but they, they long for it. And we have to remember it's not a performance, but it's standing firm in the faith of, of, a face of adversity. True power is not how many people will fall out when I lay my hand upon them in a church service that's been amped up with some amazing musician. True power is that I can love you when you would spit in my face and cuss me out and maybe even punch me and persecute me. And that's the power of Christ in my life. Don't worship someone who, who can do signs and wonders that can, that can entertain you, but look for those who are overseas right now, who their ankles are broken for the call of Christ. They're taking bullets that are losing their children for the cause of Christ Jesus. Those are the ones we look to. Amen. They stood. That's the wonder to me. I wonder. I'm amazed at the power of God working through them. But yet I, I don't see them doing the, the miracles and signs and wonders that the people who are being propped up on pedestals are doing. Mark 16 and 17 says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. Who's doing this? Those that believe. And they shall speak with new tongues. So the sign was to be followed. Not to be followed, I'm sorry. The sign was never for us to follow, but rather signs were to follow us. And we get frustrated because they're not happening on a daily basis. And so the church has begun to seek a sign. And they go and they travel to places and they say, if we get there, there's miracles that are going to take place. There's wonderful things. And so they travel, and the church is chasing a sign. And the church is looking for a sign, and they're, they're trying to find a sign. And so they're following signs. And they're saying, if I could just get to where they're having that experience, I just, I want that sign. But the, we're going the wrong direction. We're not supposed to be going to look for the sign. The sign is supposed to be a sign behind us. It should be wherever we have went, these things would take place. But we expect it every day. We expect it like the manna to come down. We expect to have a power and a click of our fingers. These things will take place. Every person that I pray for, every person. How many know we don't do anything, but it's the spirit on the inside of us? And it's by faith. But I'm telling you, we're not going to experience a bunch of it when we're chasing a sign rather than chasing God. God Chasers was a powerful book. Yes. You know, there's a lot of people that have written books. You know how it always starts off? You know what they do when these great moves of God take place? They pray. I've never read a book where it starts off where they were traveling the world looking for signs and wonders. Where they were looking for manifestation and moves. But they were seeking God, and then the signs followed after them. Amen? Let's get back to the children of Israel. See, God provided the produce of the land, and there was no longer a need for the miracle of manna. You hear me? 
There wasn't a need as much for the miracle of manna because there was the produce of the land. This new flow, I'm not preaching a new doctrine, no, no new theological word here. Follow with me. The new miracle was that they were now in the land that flows with milk and honey. Stay with me on this one. Love you, Pastor, all right? Many people ask, why are there not as many miracles in America as third world countries? I believe me and Rod were just talking about this just last week or the week before. Is this because, and here's, here's the two sides, here's the debates, and both will argue until Jesus comes back. Is it because we have more faith in doctors than we do God? Or is it because God's given us doctors that know how to heal? And it'll continue on. And if you want to be negative against the church, and if you want to be angry at the church, and if you want to find fault with the church, it's easy to blame the church and say, well, the church doesn't have faith anymore. That's why we need doctors. But I, I challenge you, the next time you go to the dentist, and he says you have a cavity, <laughs> to say, no, thank you on that anesthesia. I have faith today. <laughs> and as they begin to drill and do your root canal... <laughs> Or just say, well, you know what, that cavity is not real. I don't believe I have a cavity. I don't have cavities. I, you know, God heals me of all cavities. No, I don't have them. But as the infection gets in your bloodstream and it kills you, and you get to heaven and say, well, God, I had faith you'd heal me. And he said, I sent the dentist down there, brother. Yeah. Yeah. See, there's a real fine line, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. And we can easily, it's easy to point flaws on debates that are 50-50s all the time. God can provide. I'm thankful we live in America. Guess what? Third world countries, do you, do you want to go have surgery on your heart in a third world country? No, you want to get back home. I want to go to Indianapolis where some of the best trained men and women. And there, there, there's some believers that do practice medical. You know, I know, I, know, I know we all throw all the medical stuff out. But there are some believers. There are some godly people. That have given their life because they care about others. And we are praying, and I don't want this portion to be political, but, anyway, but we have been praying for a year for God to eradicate COVID. We have been praying for cancer. I hate cancer. I know it strikes fear in the heart of men and women. I know people who have died from cancer. And I'm believing, and we are praying, God, eradicate, destroy, stop this. And yes, we can blame the church and say, well, the church has never prayed. And, and blah, you know, the church is bad, and the, the church is just receiving judgment. We can go down all these roads, or we can just ask God to continue to do his work. And maybe it won't look like the man of yesterday. You know, whenever COVID first came out, I said, it'd be great if the only people that didn't get COVID were church people. And we all stayed free and God showed his power. Hmm, yeah. That's what I was kind of hoping for. I was like, man, this is the place where you got to come to church and we're going to lay hands on people and, and they're going to be healed. And, and then people in our church got it. And I got it. And, and I said, well, and, and Sonia prayed for me and I got healed in the middle of the night, but I was... <laughs> it, tick, it kicked my tail. I humbled me a little bit. Yeah. And I don't know. I always want to see God move in the way I want him to move. Oh. I always want God to keep on, keep on providing the manna of yesterday. I don't want anything to change. I want the revival services of yesterday. I want to run around the building and shout. I want to be praising for hours on end. I want that. But more than anything, I want his will to be done. And I want people to be saved before the final harvest. Because I truly believe we are living in a time. And rather than me dancing all over this pulpit, all over the stage, I want to see people come to know Jesus Christ. Put aside me and bring them in and see them get saved. God, do a work. I want you to hear me this morning because the Lord brought this to me. Most everybody's heard of the Azusa Street Revival, okay? It was the powerful outpouring of God in 1906. It literally birthed the Pentecostal church. 
this early revival, a godly minister stood up. He prophesied three powerful truths. And I want you to hear these, true, these three things he said. They will quench revival in our hearts, in our churches, and in our nation. These three things he said. Prophecy number one, there will be an overemphasis on power rather than righteousness. This is a revival killer. This is, takes God out of your life. An overemphasis on power rather than righteousness. If we could just lay on, if we could shout, if we could get loud, if we could pump it up, if we could stir it up, there's an overemphasis on the power of God rather than the righteousness of God. And I believe you can see it. The church is, is splitting and, and shifting and drifting because of all these things. There's a fascination with the power of God and the manifestation of God and the, the, the manna of God. But we lost track of the holiness of God. God, get us back to a holiness of God. And I know the first thing that we think of with holiness is long skirts, long hair, no makeup, Amish men. <laughs> That's something that people put in their mind. Like, I'm not doing that. I don't, if I have to look like an Amish man to make it to heaven... I'm growing my beard and shaving my mustache and getting a wagon. I don't know that God's word tells me to do that, but would that really be the worst thing you ever had to do in your life to get to heaven? It wouldn't be the worst thing. But people are so afraid of changing anything in their life because they want to do it their way. The fascination isn't on holy living, but on how to possess the ark of God. I just want the power of God. People want the power of God, but they don't want the holy living of God. Many in the church don't want to hear about sin anymore. They don't want to hear about living upright, loving your spouse and your children, being honest on the job, being fair, doing what God's word commands. They don't want to hear about that. They don't want to hear about pride of life. They don't want to hear about those things. They want to hear about the anointing power and how God's going to move in your life. And you're blessed and highly favored. You're blessed coming in and blessed going out. And all's going to be well and he's going to be there for you. But not a lot of people are real hungry for get right with God. Get right with God. Repent and be ye saved. Have the love of God overflowing in your heart. Have the joy of the Lord. The emphasis on the power Versus holiness will quench revivals when we get so hungry for the power that we forget who he is. The second prophecy was there would be an overemphasis on praise to, God, to a God they no longer pray to. Matthew 15, 18, Jesus quotes Isaiah by declaring the people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You know, we pray 30 minutes before service and I, I encourage you to, if you can't make it here for that, pray in your car. Pray for the people of your church. Pray for the service that you're attending. Pray for where you're going. Come in with an atmosphere of prayer around you. The majority of churches, the majority of people, they, they don't even call it a church service anymore. They don't call it a, a time to hear God's word. It's, it's called a worship service. It's praise, but there's no prayer. It's praise, but we're not really focused on It's a concert. It's a show. It's an entertainment. Prayer is not the popular choice. Rarely do you find churches that are consistently opened with prayer, that are bathed in prayer. Prayer is the key. I, 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 can't, I, I can't emphasize this enough to you this morning. Prayer is where we need to go. Oh, people come out for a special concert. Uh, we've got this group that you've heard on the radio coming out, and maybe you'll get an autograph, or maybe you'll, maybe you'll meet the drummers, or maybe you'll meet the members of the band. And people will come out for a show. They want an evangelist who can do something different that nobody else does and that has a sign and something unique, and we'll pack it out for those things. But if you ever want to kill a church service, call it prayer night. Come on. <laughs> call it prayer night. That's right. But we're the people of God. But what do we, they, they'll flock in from every church for a concert. Fill your seats full with a concert. Fill your seats filled up with a special speaker. But you can't hardly get the church even half full with those who attend when you call a prayer night. I've seen more churches because they don't want to do a midweek service, call it prayer night. And less and less people come till the pastor finally says, I'll just pray at home. And the doors are closed. Prayer is a killer? Wow. Yeah. 
If we want revival back in our lives, we have to turn back to prayer. Amen. The third prophecy. One of the things that would quench the revival would be an overemphasis on the gifts of the Spirit rather than the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I want you to just digest that. I'm going to say it again. An overemphasis on the gifts of the Spirit rather than the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Think of who the Holy Spirit is. What, what John 16, 13. How be it when he, the, when he, the Holy Spirit of truth, is come. What does the Holy Spirit do? He will guide you in all truth. The Holy Spirit will not speak of himself. Right? The Holy Spirit doesn't speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. What is, this is what Jesus says. The Holy Spirit will glorify me, and he shall receive of mine and shall show it to you. A key that quenched far too many services of focus on the gifts, the signs, and the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, I have no fault with the excitement, enthusiasm. I'm as Pentecostal as anybody in this. I love shouting and dance. I wish we did it more often, to be honest with you. But when that becomes the emphasis that we had a good shout and service, yeah. and man, we ran, yeah. and we did everything else, but we're not living holy, living right, we're not praying, we have an overemphasis on that, it kills revivals. It kills God moving in our church, it kills God moving in our families, in our home, and it kills God moving in our nation. An overemphasis. So, it has killed these things. Prayer, prayer is often laid up before revivals. Fasting, hearts are purged and righteous. But then the focus shifts. Because once a manifestation of the Spirit begins to bring forth signs, things change. Tell me it doesn't change. Those of you who know what I'm talking about have experienced the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Maybe you've spoken in tongues. Maybe you've shouted. Maybe you've danced. There's an emphasis that's drawn to that. There's a, there's a, a drawing of it. And yes, the lost are supposed to be saved. It's supposed to draw the lost in. It wasn't supposed to excite the church to where we seek the signs. It was supposed to draw people to salvation. And rather than that, we... No longer have a focus on holiness, no longer on prayer, but we begin to focus on the gifts and the signs, and we get mad because the church isn't experiencing it enough. Why aren't there more people dancing? Why, why isn't the Holy Spirit moving like it used to move in the churches? I remember some services where, man, we shouted, we wept, we cried, we, people get, God say, why doesn't the Spirit move? Do you ever think the Spirit is sick and tired of the church magnifying themselves and not Jesus any longer? And the, and the Spirit says, I'll hold back until you get hungry enough for Jesus. And when you really get hungry for Him, I'll move in your midst again. And I'll move and, and the people will get saved and lives will get changed and you'll feel my presence again when you really get hungry. I call it salt in the oats. I knew a young man, he, he was mad because he was working in ministry. And he was mad because he wasn't getting paid what he thought he ought to get paid. And he didn't like the things that the church was doing. And he had no, no college degrees and he had no experience. And the church gave him an opportunity to work in ministry. And he was full-time in ministry. And he wanted more money and he wanted, he wanted more recognition. And he wanted all these things. And I looked at him and I said, go get online and apply for every church out there. And I'm, I don't want to bust your bubble, but you're not going to get any opportunities. You've been given an opportunity. And you can get mad and go work in a secular job, but God will salt your oats so bad you'll beg for an opportunity to work in the church again. I'm telling you, God will salt the oats of the church. Now, I believe if any other time right now, we could be blame churches, blame pastors, blame the worship team, everybody else in the spirit not moving. Our oats are getting salted that we might get right with God. That's, I truly believe it. That we'll pray again. That we'll seek His face until we know what real holiness is again. That we will get on our knees again and stop being so comfortable again. But there's something about salt in the oats that we get hungry for God. We get hungry for, for, for hearing the true word of God. That we don't mind our toes getting stepped on, that we don't mind the fact that everything's not about me anymore, but it's about a lost world, and we turn our hearts towards Jesus again. Man, he can move again. I believe he wants to move, but our, and we're getting thirstier and thirstier. 
people are getting angrier and angrier. And God don't, he's sitting back there saying, look at y'all. Look at the church. Come on. It starts with prayer. It starts with prayer, doesn't it? It'll get us crossed over. See, we're crossing over. We're living in some different times, church. I want the bread and manna of yesterday, and I want church the way I was remember it, and I want God the way I want God, and I want people to do what people need to be doing, and I want I, I, I. And he says, you've crossed over, and you're going to eat of the fruit of the land, and it's going to be different than it ever was before, because I've got a plan for your life. See, we all wanted to be living in the end time. We all wanted to be used of God. We all wanted to experience, and we thought, mighty outpourings of God. Whoa, they're going to fill cathedrals. And, and we, didn't know, we didn't realize that the outpouring of God was supposed to come up out of our bellies, was rivers of living water that was going to flow up. And, the, and God was moving through us, not through entertainment, yeah. not on social media, not through the Internet. Amen. God wants us to live off the fruit of the land. I'm going to sum it up, and I'm putting a bow on it right now. Not God, what God can you do for me? I think John F. Kennedy said something similar to this. God, what kind of miracle? Stop asking God what miracles you can do around me. But God, what can you do through me and in me? What fruit of the Spirit can really come up in my life? Please hear me out on this last part. God, I, that the last day sign and wonder would be love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, that the fruit of the Spirit would overflow in my life. Amen. Let's be real. You start showing the fruit of the Spirit, some people might sit there and think of miracles taking place in our lives. Amen? <laughs> ah. <laughs> When was the last time people said, man, the love of God is beaming out of you today? When was the last time they said, you've never been so nice to me in all my days I've known you? When was the last time somebody said, I, you've got the patience of Job on the inside of you? When was the last time somebody said these things, that you've got more self-control than anybody I've ever seen in my life? My, I don't understand how you're doing it. It's a miracle. Get it? You're the miracle. Amen. That's the bow on the package right there. Amen. We wanted miracles, and now we got them, and we got we to gotta eat them and live off of it. We're the miracle. It'll do us no good to jump out of wheelchairs if, we're, if we don't love people. It'll do us no good to heal backs and, and legs and elbows and arms if we don't have any kindness in our life. It'll be us no good to deliver the demoniac if there's no self-control in their life and they just jump right back into it. It'd do me no good to have all those things if I don't have the most miraculous power and the greatest sign and wonder of loving people. Richard Wormbrand looked at the guy breaking his ankles and beating and said, I am praying for you and I love you. That's, that's powerful. We horn cuss people when they cut us off. It'd be a sign and a miracle. People call me up from other churches using profanity about the church. They don't even realize they're saying it. It's coming up out of their... Sp it's all on the inside of them. Yeah. Mm. My God. If we'll get back to doing some simplicity, it's too easy. If, if we lined you up and prayed over you, and I had a televangelist in here and anointed oil, everybody in here get prayed for twice. But it's too easy. You just got to pray and ask, and he'll begin to break forth those foundations. It's too easy. It's, it's too easy. We, we can't have it that easy. We got we to gotta do something to be different, to be special. 
and you are special when the Holy Spirit's working through you. Amen. And there's something, I, I've known some people that flow with that spirit that have changed my life. Shane changed my life. Greg, a man named Greg changed my life when I was 18 and I had long hair and smoked dope and, and Greg changed my life as a missionary man and he sat out there when nobody else did on the, on the dock at the factory and told me about the love of Jesus and how he loved the people in Africa and he'd work six months and then he would come back and then he would go back six months and he was doing it because he loved people and he loved God and, and I will never forget Greg. He it was a miracle. It doesn't matter how many people I prayed for, those people I'll never forget. They were signs and wonders. Signs and wonders. I'm telling you, you can be the greatest sign and wonder God ever shows anybody. Amen. Let me close with this. I think the kids are about to go crazy back there. They're feeling the spirit. <laughs> You're like, praise God, he's closing. We won't need the man of miracle when the spirit starts working on the inside of us. Amen. Amen. I'm sick and tired of people laying hands on people that aren't living right. That's good. Uh -huh. yeah. That's good. Yeah. And I, I don't, I don't like talking about any any preacher. They they've fallen, you know. But men sleeping on, or sleeping around with other women and, and praying for people. Uh -huh. right. men, men, men prophesying because they just know how to put some words together. And people walking home, all kinds of shaken up because the word of God came through. That's not the church. That's we become a mockery. The church's power was when we got together and got on our knees and called out to heaven and the love of God starts breaking through. And we, we are not, we're not, we're not, we're not divided by race. We're not divided by economics. We're not divided by anything, but we genuinely care about each other. And I, yeah, we're not perfect. We got a long ways to go. That's why every day, like the manna that we collected every day, we got to get on our knees instead of collecting manna. We're getting the manna from God on the inside again. The spirit, we're eating from the fruit of the land. See, the Old Testament, they ate the manna. In the New Testament, it's a different, it's just the fruit of the spirit. You're eating of the fruit of the land. Every day you got to collect it. Paul said, every day I die. Every day. Every day I crucify this flesh. It's a miracle if you do it. You're a sign. You're a wonder to a lost world when you walk in those things. I'm going to challenge you this morning to hunger for righteousness. Just like you, just like you'd hung, just, just like some of you are hungry for that steak right now that you're going to eat. It's like some of you are thinking about some of that chicken you're going to have this afternoon. And come on, if I start talking about food, you start getting hungry. If I start talking about mashed potatoes with white gravy drizzled all over it and those rolls from Texas Roadhouse with that cinnamon, you can taste it, can't you? Come on. Some of you, maybe it's a salad with the, your favorite dressing. You can, you can taste it, can't you? But the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, man, man we, know how, we, know, we know every restaurant in town. And, and some people know every church in town. But don't, don't, get a fix, don't get a fix on the church. Don't get a fix on the restaurant. Get a fix on Jesus, man. Jesus. Oh, my gosh. If, I want to be more loving. I want to be able to look at people right in the eye and love them no matter how much they hate my guts and say, I care about you more than how you're hurting and piercing me right now. I want to be able to lead people to Jesus Christ because not because I want to add another butt on a chair, but because of the fact that I want to keep them from spending eternity in hell. I want to be kind to people. I want to treat everybody with kindness. Just because they didn't bring my, my, my refill out enough times, I don't want to sit there and be chintzy at the restaurant. That's somebody for later on today. I want to be kind and say, you know what, God's bigger than that. Here's the miracle. Whatever, whatever you, however you treat me, I'm still treating you great. Because I've got this, I'm eating of the fruit of the land. I'm blessed. I'm highly favored. Guess what? I got to go to church this morning. I got a good job. I can pay for it. You're working. Your life's miserable. And you didn't, you didn't bring me an extra drink. And so I'm going to hold back on you. I'm going to teach you a lesson. No, I got kindness. I want to walk in all these things at a deeper level. That's a miracle, isn't it? 
love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, meek, lowly, prefer my brother over myself. George, how you feeling? I'm more, I'm more concerned about how you're feeling than how I'm feeling. I'm more upset that you're not well than because I do feel well. I don't have an expecta ex expectation for you to do anything but just get whole, that the Lord just moves in your life. We're more concerned about others. I challenge you to pray this morning, but not just this morning, but every morning. Instead of picking up the manna, we're eating of the fruit of the land. God, give me that strength to love people, to be kind to people, to be gentle with people, be patient today, to be good. And let revival come again, because I believe when we get all those down, just maybe, maybe we'll start dancing again. <laughs> maybe we'll shout a little bit again. We won't shout because we're excited about it. We're exci we'll shout because souls are saved. We'll shout because miracles are taking place.